Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the University of Tulsa, welcome back to the BOK Center for today's Between Rounds interviews featuring the four winning schools from yesterday's first round action. Today's sessions are 40 minutes long per school, equally divided between the student athletes and the head coach. The same housekeeping guidelines are in force. Please silence your cell phones. Each time we introduce a new dais, please identify yourself and your affiliation the first time you ask a question. Please wait for one of our two mic holders so we can get your uh, question. Uh, if you have a follow-up question, remind the mic holder so he or she stays with you. There is no flash photography allowed, nor recording of any kind, including cell phones and tablet use. The coordinates are the same as the last two days. Satellite is AMC15 slash K20C as in cat. AMC15 K20C. The downlink number is 12104.50H. That's 12104.50H. First up will be the Baylor Bears student athletes, Jake Lindsay, Manu Lacant, and Ishmael Wainwright for 20 minutes, 135 to 155, and Scott Drew will follow. Baylor will play USC tomorrow, approximately 6.45 p.m., 30 minutes after the first game. As advertised, Jake, Manu, and Ishmael are with us, and we will start right off with questions. Start right down here, left-hand side. Thank you. Uh, John Warner, Waco Tribune. Uh, this is for Jake. Um, have you had much of a chance to look at USC yet, and do they look similar to anybody you faced? Sorry, uh, we had a chance to look at them last night. Uh, they had a scout prepared uh, for all of our possible opponents, so we hopped right into that and uh, went over some of their stuff today. So we've gotten pretty familiar with personnel and uh, some of the actions they like to run. So uh, as far as being similar to anybody, um, maybe Iowa State, because they just have a lot of guys who can really shoot it, but uh, they're a little bit bigger. Um, Benny Boatwright is a matchup problem. Uh, Jordan McLaughlin's a really good player. They're uh, they're a good team, and uh, we're we're looking forward to the challenge. Right in the center, Janine. Thank you. Hi guys, congratulations again. Um, other than X's and O's, or schematically, what jumps off? the film when you watch how USC plays, how they manage to do what they do, you know, what, what stands out, maybe intangibles or however you want to describe it? Manu, you first and then Ishmael. Uh, they're a very talented team. They play freely, you know. Um, <clears throat> they have a lot of talents. They have, they have a lot of shooters and good post players, so it makes it uh, hard to guard them. He said what I was going to say. Um, they have a great point guard. Uh, Boat Wright's, uh, I mean, I know he's NBA. Everybody's you know, saying he's an NBA guy. Uh, he's a great player. Um, they have a shooter, I believe, on the 30. That's, real, that's extreme. He can shoot anywhere on the court. Uh, he had big shots last game to win the game. So um, they're just a great team. Um, we watched the game and had film, um, walked through a lot of their sets. I know they're going to add more wrinkles to it. So um, just go. Do whatever we have to do. 
execute. For Ish, Ish, John Morris, Baylor Radio, what, what does it mean for you as a senior to still be alive and still be moving on in the NCAA tournament? And is there a load off your shoulders having won that first round game yesterday? I'm going to start with that last question. It's um, load is off. Uh, I'm not worried about the past two years or three years or whatever people say. Um, and with me being a senior, it's just a blessing. I mean, I know I've seen a lot of seniors uh, leave recently, which is tough. Um, and I mean, just having guys like Manu and Jake by my side to, you know, take me, take us a long way. And yeah, it's not just excited. I'm still playing. My career is not over yet. I want to, I want to end this with a win. So. We're going to center, then we'll go to the aisle. Uh, Ish Ben, maybe with the Dallas Morning News, kind of to follow up on that. Uh, how much did kind of those early exits weigh on y'all going into the tournament as much as y'all, you know, thought about it? Say that again? How much did the early exits in the first, the last two years weigh on y'all heading into this tournament? Um, it's just motivation. I mean, I know we're young. Our generation is on, you know, social media, and that's all we were getting. Uh, and that's all we were, they were preaching to us. There's no first round. They were saying this two months ago. Um, and we took it to heart, and we have a lot more to do. We're not done yet. Uh, our confidence is up, and we're going to continue to play with a chip on our shoulder. Paul Catalina, ESPN Central Texas. Manu, yesterday was your first start back. How was it in the rhythm, getting in the rhythm, and how you feeling, and the ankle and everything? Um, <clears throat> it felt good uh, coming back with my team. Start again uh, was fun. I was pretty excited. My ankle was it, it was okay, not 100 percent, but mentally I was good. And uh, man, our bench did a great job. Uh, I didn't uh, play my best game, but. Um, Jake came in, did a great job. TJ Al Nooney uh, picked us up, gave us a little, uh, a, a huge spark off the bench. So that helped me a lot. You know how people talk about like tournament destiny or magic or whatever you want to call it. I'm just curious to get each of your thoughts on is USC come across as one of those teams that you kind of have to be wary of because of their two improbable wins now? Just curious about your thoughts about whatever you want to call that. <laughs> Jake will be first, Manu, then Ishmael. Um, I feel like, I mean, we had a few comeback wins early in the season at, in the Bahamas. And uh, when you have a few wins like that, it definitely sparks a, a sense of belief in your team. I remember when we uh, we came back down 22 to Louisville. Uh, it really it really boosts your confidence. And uh, I mean, credit to them. I think 12 of their 26 wins, something like that, has been down either either down or double digit deficit, something crazy. So I mean, credit to them, and that uh, that shows they have some resilience and uh, some fight to them. And uh, they don't get down when the chips are down. So that's you know that's an awesome accomplishment for them. But as far as we look at it, uh, I mean every game's going to be different. You know, if they came in and go, if they started the game off on a huge run or we started the game off on a huge run, the narrative would uh, shift pretty quickly as to whose tournament magic per se would be uh, going at the time. So I don't think uh, that's weighing too much on our mind. Um, yeah, like Jake said, it's a great team, um, but uh, I think we're the team uh, they have to worry about. I think in, in, in the beginning of the year, nobody would have thought we would even be in a tournament. So uh, uh, it's March and uh, anything can happen. My turn. Yes. <laughs> um, we just can't look over any, we can't overlook anybody. Uh, like you said, this is March. Uh, anything is possible. Um, I know a lot of teams that looked over look past other teams and prepare for teams that they're supposed to play the next round. And they're no longer with us, but we can't look over. We can't overlook anybody, and they can't overlook us. So it's going to be a great one. We are halfway through the session. Next question's up. Uh, Manu, you ended up uh, in a – Baylor ended up in a region with Miami. Uh, what was that experience like for you, and did you end up talking to any of those guys, or kind of what was that – what were the interactions like with you and some of the guys you might have played there with? Uh, <clears throat> I haven't seen any of the guys here, um, but um, I always, you know, I always talk to some of them on the team. We have a, still a great relationship. Obviously, it was a great experience for me 
two years uh, in Miami. Gave me the chance they came here at Baylor, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, not so they lost against uh, Michigan State, but um, it's, it's still a great team. It, it was fun uh, watching them play. For Jake and Manu, what does it say about your team this year that guys like Al and TJ can come off the bench and have the kind of games that they had yesterday? Jake, lead us off, please. Um, I think I would start off by saying that uh, Al and TJ are two of our most talented players. And uh, if you if you had the opportunity to come watch us in practice, there'd be some days you'd walk away thinking Terry Maston was the best big guy in the gym. And uh, when you have two NBA big guys as your teammates, that's an, that's an impressive thing to say about anybody. So uh, his his performance yesterday didn't, didn't surprise us. And uh, Al yesterday too. Al was, you know, two-year starter. Uh, been a big part of what we wanted to do. Uh, faced some adversity this year. Rebounded from it. And uh, as a credit to him, he's come back even better. Been shooting the ball great. Uh, been a great teammate. And uh, we were all really happy to see him, uh, you know, really pick us up yesterday and make some big plays. And uh, those those two uh, have both rebounded from some adversity this year, and we're proud of him. Happy for him. Yeah, they both had a great game um, yesterday. Uh, but like Jake said, um, didn't surprise anybody, I think, on the team. Because we, we, I mean, you can come watch practice, and then they can go off like that any time in practice. So it's, it's always great to have people like that coming off the bench and, get, and give you a spark you know, when you struggle, too. So it's great. Anything else? Little gentleman from Baylor. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. Good luck. Scott Drew will be next at 155.
Head coach of the Baylor Bears is here, Scott Drew. He's got a date with USC tomorrow, and he's going to he's going to make an opening statement on that game, and then we'll go to questions. Scott, please. Well, we're excited to be here to answer questions today. I know uh, um, uh, the benefit of playing the early game yesterday is we got to. Uh, uh, be able to relax and uh, get some rest and watch all the exciting games as far as um, SC goes. Uh, anyone that advances uh, uh, to the second round is obviously a, a very good team. Uh, Andy does a great job uh, X and O wise um, and uh, poses a lot of challenges, especially in short turnarounds because their offense is uh, uh, a little different. They, they run a lot of different sets. Um, as far as our team goes, uh, the good thing is uh, I think uh, um, after yesterday's game and, and being able to get the uh, jitters out, hopefully uh, uh, we'll be able to be a little more efficient in the beginning of the game and not, not turn it over so much. So that's all I got. Questions for the head coach? Start right down here. Thank you. John Werner, Waco Tribune. Um, uh, Coach Anfield said, uh, you guys know each other fairly well, I mm -hmm. guess. Uh, and uh, I guess also, uh, do you see similarities with his team here at USC to, to maybe Florida Gulf Coast? Well, I think uh, um, the shoot, shooting the three like they do, uh, uh, their offense, the way they run it, uh, they get a lot of opportunities at the rim. And with the great athletes that he has, that, that usually leads to a lot of the dunks. So um, you see similarities as far as that. That, that manner goes. Threes and dunks. On your left, Janine. Hi, Hi Coach. Janine Edwards, ESPN. Um, what stands out to you, what jumps off the page about USC in how they do what they do? Not mm -hmm. necessarily the X's and O's, mm -hmm. but what do you see when you watch them play? Mm -hmm. well, I think it's their, their resilience uh, to be down double digits 13 times and come back and win. I remember in the beginning of the year for a while there, we, we led the nation in comeback wins from being down at halftime. So uh, I don't know who wants to be up at halftime. Maybe it's better if you're down in this game. But um, I think uh, uh, their resilience, and because they do shoot so many threes, they're never out of a game, even if they, if they are, find themselves down. One thing that is interesting, both of us started out the year so hot they didn't lose their first game till I believe December 30th, and we were us and Gonzaga were the last two teams before we lost a game. So uh, I think both of us did a great job in the non-conference, and then I know they got a little banged up, we got a little banged up, and I think both of us are peaking right now again. Scott, they played that first four game the other night. Is that an advantage or a disadvantage? <laughs> I mean, they've got some momentum going, so that, that's got to be at least something. Well, if you think about fatigue, you would have thought yesterday, second half, they would have, that's when it sh would have showed up, but they shot lights out. And nowadays, I think uh, with exempt tournaments, three games in three days, conference tournaments, three games in three days, AU basketball, three games in one day, uh, these guys can go all day long. I think it's us adults that need rest. Over here in the left-hand sky. Scott, you're uh, connected to one of the all-time great buzzer beaters in NCAA tournament mm -hmm. history. We haven't really had that through the first two days. Do you have any thoughts on why that's been the case, some of these finishes? Well, when you're, when you're preparing your team, that's the only bad side of things. You don't get a chance to watch many other games because you're watching so much film of your team and the opponent. Uh, I, I would think uh, – um, I know there were some games where, especially early on, from what I from what I've heard, uh, there wasn't a lot of separation until maybe later in the game. So, uh, and there wasn't for the first time someone that won by what more than twenty uh, uh, in the first day. Or uh, I know someone had mentioned that. So my point is, I think we've had close games. We just haven't had uh, uh, a lot of buzzer beaters. Um, as long as if we do have one, we're on the right side of it. I'm good with it. Uh, otherwise, I'd prefer not to. <laughs> and, and the thing about March is if you're in it long enough, you're going to have great experiences and in, in tough ones. My brother's is probably my all-time favorite memory. And then, uh, um, you know, us coaches' sons are always partial to other coaches' sons. So uh, I'm happy for R.J. Hunter hitting that buzzer beater against us, but um, obviously that was a tougher, tougher side of things for me. 
right back down here. Thank you. Scott, in some ways, is maybe a second game a little easier to prepare for, you know, once you kind of get over that, that hurdle of the first game? Well, I think in the, the first game, you do so much more prep work, and there is more jitters in that first game. I think the second game, uh, coaches don't have as much time to, to mess up their guys, so they get to play more, and they're a little more relaxed. So I think players always like the second game better. Al said yesterday that the way the flow of the, the game went for him without having a whole lot of complex things to do kind of opened it up for him. Uh, that's obviously not going to happen all the time, but mm -hmm. uh, how, how, do you, how do you recreate that and still have the, the structure of the plays calling and all that stuff? Well, I think more it was the flow of the game. It was an up and down game. We were in transition a lot. And you'll find more of that with uh, teams that you're not as familiar with, but at the same time, um, that's because New Mexico State liked to play an up and down game and rather than uh, a half court game. So uh, with, with SC and us, both of us uh, uh, like to play in transition when it's there. But why both of us have won games is we can play in the half court as well. So I think you have two teams that uh, uh, um, have a lot of similarities, a lot of great athletes, and uh, a lot of good players. Right back down here in the left. Thank you. Scott, do you maybe see USC as a little bit of an underrated team as an 11 seed that it had to go through a play-in game? Well, well, one thing I know about uh, uh, the NCAA tournament, the, uh, I'm going into this year, I think since the tournament expanded to 68, 5, and 12 were even as far as win-loss record. To me, I, I say that every year. It doesn't matter your number. If you're in the tournament, you've won a lot of games, you've got talented players, you're well coached. So uh, I really don't look at the numbers as much. Uh, I think everyone that's in it is, is more than capable of winning any game, especially with the parity. Um, but you look at USC, they were one of the best teams in the country at the beginning of the year. Then they had some injuries. And when you do, it affects everybody. And now they're healthy and they're back to being one of the best in the country. Again, to go undefeated until one of the last six or how many teams, that's, that's quite a tribute out of 351. I know you guys don't have a lot of questions today because it's nice out. You're trying to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else for Scott? All right, we're going to let him go and get out of here. Okay, thank you. Guys you guys have a good day. <clears throat> Student athletes are next at 2.20. USC student athletes at 
NCAA tournament in Tulsa. Press conference, mic check, one, two, three, four. NCAA tournament. First and second round press conference in Tulsa. Mic check, one, two, three, four. The USC Trojans are with us. They have a date with the Baylor Bears tomorrow, approximately 6.45 after game one. Elijah Stewart and DeAnthony Melton are representing the student body, and we'll go right into questions. Right there. Janine, thank you. Hi, guys. Janine Edwards, ESPN. What you've seen of Baylor so far on tape, what jumps out at you, and um, what are they really good at, and what are you hoping you can possibly exploit a little bit? Elijah, you first, please, then we'll go to DeAnthony. Uh, they're a good team at all positions. Um, they, they really don't quit, so I've seen that they blew out the lead uh, in their last game. It was a close game all the way through to like, like the last 15. And, uh, we just got to come out ready to play. Um, I think it really depends on who plays harder. Uh, it doesn't matter who's better. Cause sometimes better team wins, better team loses. So it just depends on who can, who can play harder and who can get stops at the end of the game. John Warner, Waco Tribune, this for Elijah. Um, what's it like to play for Coach Enfield? Uh, just kind of what's the atmosphere like? Uh, seems like, um, you know, he'd kind of be maybe a player's coach. Um, I mean, we've been together for like three years now. Um, it's been, it's just been a fun opportunity. He recruited me to come change the culture. And as y'all seen, we've been doing a pretty good job progressing year after year. And I just, I always try to just do what he tells me, um, play with an offense, and just be a good teammate. Right back. Thank you. OK, so let's get down to the nitty gritty here. You guys are really becoming like the comeback kids. <laughs> I don't know how many times you've been down this year, and in games where you look like there's no way you're going to pull this off. So where is that coming from? How is that happening? How do you guys describe it? DeAnthony, lead us off. Um, I would describe it as shows how much we want it and shows we're never out of games because, like I said before, if you play hard and just trust, trust what the coaches are telling us, then the ball is eventually going to go in. And we just trust our defense, our defensive principles, then we're eventually going to get stops too. No team for, uh, well, no team I've ever played for has ever allowed Quinn to be 
an option that's been since like high school, play underneath uh, at Azam, and he just put that mentality in me. Like we've been down 20 points and came back and won by 20. It's just it's just like a different monster in people. Um, I feel like we just we just don't accept like defeat very well. So if we're down 15, 20, we're, we're always going to try to make a comeback. It's it's just no quit and quiz not option. If I could just follow up real quick. So, but how are you getting down in the first place? Like, I'm just curious about this whole roller coaster, how this happens that you're trailing and then you find a way to come back. Have you, have you even discussed that amongst yourselves? Like, why are we getting down in the first place? Elijah? A lot of games I've noticed where we take a huge hit in the first half is that the other team's just usually hitting, hitting a lot of shots, uncharacteristic plays. Um, we try to stick to the scout, to the, like, like to the key. And uh, sometimes, you know, this is Division One basketball, sometimes people just step up, make those plays that they don't usually make. And once we do that, we always come back in the huddle, second half, and just congregate and get the, the new scout new assignment, new game plan, and we just try to execute it. Uh, sometimes we can't control if people make shots. We can just try to alter them as best as possible. But if people are hitting shots and we're not hitting shots, then we just got to focus in on what's working for us and we try to exploit what's, what's not working for them or what's struggling for them. So we just want to keep ex uh, struggling for making it struggle for other teams and just keep playing hard. Right back on this side. D'Anthony, it sounds like you had a pretty good conversation with Coach Hart in the middle of that game yesterday. Uh, what did he say to you that, that got you going? Uh, he just gave me a little confidence booster. Uh, kind of got into me talking about uh, some, a lot of Jay Hart stuff. So, uh, some of the stuff kind of just stays in the huddle, huddle, but he just really helped me and just getting my confidence back, always attacking the basket and just being a lot more active. The new saying now is, I mean, he said it during the Providence game, got us, got us going. He was like, we're supposed to be at the crib keeping 1,000. I mean, <laughs> like, we weren't supposed to, to like even make the tournament. Yeah. So we just kind of keep that chip on our shoulder right now and we're just riding with it. Anything else for the gentleman from USC? Okay, thank you, gentlemen. You're dismissed. Right, thank you. Good job. Head coach Andy Enfield will be next at 240.
And as advertised right on time, the USC Trojans head coach, Andy Enfield, is here. He's got a date with Baylor tomorrow, approximately 6.45. We're going to ask him to open up with a statement, and then we'll go to questions. Andy, please. We had a great game against SMU. That's what March Madness is all about. We were fortunate to be on the right side this year at the buzzer instead of last year where we lost at the buzzer. So we're excited to move on to face a very challenging Baylor team that has 27 wins and is one of the better teams we've seen all season. Start right here. Thank you. John Warner, Waco Tribune Hero. Coach, uh, what, uh, what impresses you about Baylor, um, just, just kind of their overall game? They're a lot like us. They started out the year undefeated. They had some injuries like we did, and then they finished strong. They have a lot of length, shot blocking. Their guards can shoot, very physical. So they're just a very well-balanced team and, and do a lot of things offensively and defensively to make you work. And so uh, we're, we're extremely impressed with them. Hi, Coach. Um, how many years do you think this group of players has taken off your life this season? <laughs> well, they, uh, they certainly make it interesting. When you go back and watch our game films and we study and, and see what we can improve, it, it's, uh, it's amazing how streaky we are for the good and for the bad. Uh, but really enjoy this group of players because they keep playing for 40 minutes, and sometimes they don't know what the score is, and they – uh, they're fun to watch, uh, but they're also a little, it's a little challenging to coach at times because uh, we're bad enough to get behind and good enough to come back. And, and, uh, but we play for 40 minutes. As you saw the other night, it was fun, uh, exciting. And you know, at the end of the game, you, you'd like to have a lead, but you just have to, uh, when you're going in the last minute of certain games, you just have to make plays down the stretch. And the other night, we were able to do that. If I could just follow up. I mean, how have your... Um, messages to your team evolved over this season based on how many times you've fallen behind and had to come back? Just how, how has your approach kind of ebbed and flowed with, with this group? Well, early in the season, we used to get really mad at our players for falling behind, especially with teams we thought we, we were equally talented or even had more talent than. Uh, but now, uh, at halftime the other night, we just said, hey, this, this is great. We're only down eight. You're down 15 the other night. This is great. They all, and our players start laughing. And, but that was our halftime speech. Hey, this is awesome. <laughs> right behind you, Don. Coach John Morris, Baylor Radio. Do you see some similarities in your season and Baylor's season with uh, your 14-0 and start coming from behind to win so many games? Do you see some similarities there? Yeah, I think both teams have had similar seasons. If you look at the records, uh, our wins in early, and then, and then we had the injuries, and, and then late. Uh, so uh, I think the teams are similar as far as their size and length. We have big guys shot blocking. We steal the ball. They, they, they're big shot blockers. They, their, their zone gives a lot of trouble. Uh, we play zone as well. So I, I think it's two very good basketball teams that, that have similar strengths and, and um, uh, I think it, uh, the games just come down to uh, who can execute uh, what they do better. Coach, most teams don't have it in them to stage comeback after comeback after comeback like the Trojans have this season. So what is it emotionally about this group that's different? It's, uh, it's hard to figure out. Uh, we don't try to get behind. And our players have great team chemistry. So it is nice when you're part of a, a team that has that type of chemistry. They rely on each other. They can talk to each other and they can motivate each other so it takes a lot off the coaches sometimes we have to do the motivating as well but uh, they're able to stick together at, at the times and they, and they don't hang their heads they just keep playing uh, and, and they have a, a, some kind of confidence about them that if uh, if they play hard enough for 40 minutes that eventually they'll be back in the game and have a chance to win and we've seen it so many times this year so uh, there's no formula we, we certainly don't try to get behind but but unfortunately uh, at times we do. Uh, I read that you have uh, 18 school records at Johns Hopkins, and I was wondering which of the 18 you're most proud of. <laughs> well, I don't like to talk about myself because it's really about our players here, but 
uh, I guess uh, uh, my NCAA free throw record is probably the record that I was most proud of at 92.5% for my career. And I think that was, I had it for 17 years and was broken by Blake Ainhorn of um, Missouri State, who was a better shooter than me. Uh, but uh, it, it was something that uh, uh, spent a, took a lot of pride in and, and uh, really made my career as a shooter. And, and then I uh, was able to break into uh, basketball business and coaching uh, through that uh, shooting ability. Coach, of course you guys had to play a play-in game to get here. Uh, do you see that as maybe playing that extra game? Maybe it was beneficial because uh, you all have kind of gotten on a, a little bit of a roll here. The playing game is the NCAA tournament. That was great. We, we enjoyed that, to go to Dayton and, and have that atmosphere and, and, and compete against a team from the Big East in Providence. It was ironic we played them last year, but they're a totally different team, and so are we. So, wow, was that exciting. Uh, and then we were able to come here. So the NCAA tournament's the same all over the country. That, that anxiety, the anxiousness, the, the, you walk out and, 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 the, and the crowd, the excitement. Just, just uh, And you saw we've had two kind of epic March Madness games here this week. And so hopefully it'll be a third tomorrow. But that's what this tournament's all about. You, you win, you stay in it. You lose, you go home. And uh, that's why you see all the emotions of the players and the fans and, and the families that attend. It's just a special, special event. Back to Janine. Coach, what are some of the more important um, nuances or aspects of the low post game that you see in facing Baylor with Motley and Luau Akeel? And, you know, how do you think you can kind of attack that? They love the high-low action to use their size, so we, we have to be prepared for that. Uh, Motley has great footwork in the low post, and uh, he can also step out a little bit. Uh, but they're, they're one of the best low post scoring teams we've seen. I think last night uh, they only had four threes in the whole game, four for eight, I believe they were. So they can dominate the low post. They had 50 points in the paint uh, in their first round game. So we can't give up 50 points in the paint and expect to win. And we have to do a good job of uh, playing man and zone and, and uh, hope they miss some shots. Right there in front of you. Coach, the, the Pac-10 has had three teams that have spent a lot of time in the top ten this year. How is going against those teams and some of the others prepared you guys for this? It's a Pac-12. Pac-10 is a – but uh, the three teams at the top of our league all ranked in the top ten, and we played those teams seven times. We also played SMU twice now. So we've played – nine games with teams that have 28, 29 or more wins. I think we're the only team in the nation that, that has done that. Uh, so this NCAA tournament, our league prepared us for this NCAA tournament because from a talent perspective and from the, the toughness and, and the, uh, the talent uh, across the board in the Pac-12, this, this is a, it's no different than our league games. And it's a different stage. And it means a lot more here than a typical Pac-12 regular season game because this is the biggest event in the, in the country. So, but from a preparation standpoint, we feel like we can compete for, with anybody, and I think you've seen that. And we just have to play well uh, tomorrow. Anything else for the head coach of USC? Okay, Andy, thank you very much. Thank you. And good luck tomorrow. Appreciate it. Student athletes of the Jayhawks of Kansas will be up next at 310. 310 for Kansas student athletes.
student athletes from the University of Kansas Jayhawks are here. They have a date with Michigan State tomorrow, 4.15 Central Time. Frank Mason III and Devontae Graham will answer any questions. We're down to one mic holder, so be a little patient as she climbs over everyone. Go ahead. Two questions, both of them for you, Frank. First of all, can you talk about on tape what you see differences in how Michigan State plays when Cassius is in at the point and when Tum Tum is and then when they're together? Um, I think they play really, really fast. Uh, when Tom Tom's in, you know, he gets the ball up the uh, court. Uh, really fast, uh, he changes pace uh, really good, and when Cash is in, uh, he's he's a great passer, and uh, he's not as fast as Tom Tom, but you know uh, he still has great vision, and they're both really good point guards. As a follow up, can you talk about how your style will change depending on who's in guarding you, please? I'm sorry. Could you talk about how your style will change depending on who's in guarding you? Um, my style won't change. Uh, our style as a team won't change. You know, uh, we just play the way coach wants us to play, uh, execute our plays, and just really guard on the defensive end. Left-hand side, gentlemen. Uh, Devontae, uh, Chris Lazarino, Kansas alumni. Devontae, um, in terms of getting uh, your momentum back after the TCU loss, did the game yesterday accomplish it, not just the big win, but the way you guys did it, you know, with style points? So, so to speak. Uh, I think we got a lot of momentum out of that game. Um, you know, after a loss like that, you want to come out and, and play really well. Uh, first game of the tournament. Uh, and I felt like we did a good job, especially on the defensive end. So I think it got us uh, a little bit of momentum. In the back, Dawn, thank you. Uh, for either player, when you when you were deciding to go to Kansas, how much of a determining factor did Coach Self have in your final decision? And then a second part, can you just talk a little bit about just the connection he seems to have with former players that played at Kansas from your perspective? We'll have both players answer that. Devonte, you'll start off, please. Oh uh, well, Coach Self had a big role in you know coming here. I feel like with every player he had uh, that comes here, you know, you just get a good good feel from him. You know, he's. Uh, He's a great coach, and, and just being on your recruiting visit and, and talking with him and him talking to your family, you know, you get a good vibe from him, and, and you feel like you can come here, and he'll take care of you. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not like he, he's an actor trying to put on a show when you're on your recruiting visit. He actually is a real, genuine guy and cares about you and your family, and uh, he had a huge role in me coming here. Uh, yeah, same as Devontae said. Um, you know, Coach Self's a great guy. Um, he teaches us a lot on and off the court, and, you know, we're just thankful for those things. But uh, other than that, you know, it's just the Kansas tradition and, you know, uh, all the things he has accomplished since he's been here and before Kansas, you know, really played a big role in me coming to Kansas. And, um, you know, I'm just happy to be a part of this great tradition. Hey, Frank, Kurt Voigt, Associated Press, way down here. Hey. You've been around long enough now. You probably have a pretty good idea of Michigan State's reputation as somewhat of a giant killer. What what do you know of what they've done as a lower seed against higher seeds in the tournament, and, and how does that maybe help you prepare uh, for facing them and getting ready? Uh, well, it's Michigan State. You know, uh, no matter how that season is, um, you know, there's a great tradition there, a great coaching staff. You know, Tom Izzo is one of the best, and I think he do a great job of pre preparing his guys uh, for these type of moments. And um, I think the guys, you know, when they get to the NCAA tournament, um, you know, uh, they play their best ball and they really get up and down and they defend. And, you know, that's when they really need to play their best ball here in the tournament. I think they do a great job of that. Frank, um, Coach Self said before the tournament started that he was hoping for you guys to play with a free and easy, with an easy mind. But he's noted that that can be a concern sometimes with, with young players who might be only playing one year at the school and that they may tense up in their only tournament chance. Judging by what we saw yesterday, it looks like that's not going to be a problem for Josh, but did you think that he was going to respond that way and you've been working with him on how to play free and easy like Coach wants? Well, Josh is a great player, and, you know, uh, he prepared for these moments and experiences, and um, I think he has handled it. Uh, pretty good so far, and yesterday uh, he did a lot of great things for us, and 
I don't think he was nervous at all, or I'm not sure if he had any jitters or whatever, but uh, he did a great job, and, you know, uh, we would need that from him moving forward. Right down here in the third row. Thank you. What's the toughest part of preparing for Michigan State? Devontae, take that one, please. Um, they run so many plays and got so many sets uh, that one day of preparation, you know, you really can't get a good feel for all the stuff they run and, or try to memorize a lot of their plays. And um, But we just had practice and we just went over the scouting report kind of in depth and we'll go back to the hotel and do the same thing. So it's just trying to, you know, get a good feel for a lot of the sets that they run. Ernie Boone with the Michigan Bulletin. Frank, what f for for your position are the keys to beating this team? Um, I would say, you know, creating easy shots for my teammates, uh, getting them involved early, um, playing great defense, and you know, making them feel me every possession because it starts with the point guard and just say getting out in transition, running, and trying to. Uh, get easy baskets for the defense set up, uh, showing great leadership skills and just being coachable and, you know, uh, leading our younger guys. Frank, is one of Michigan State's points guard, point guards, Cassius Winston's a young guy who sometimes struggles on ball screens and, and it's been sort of a, a project defensively this year. The other guy, Tum Tum Nairn, is a little better there. Do you notice the difference when you see him on tape and when you get a young guy like that, who's still trying to figure it out defensively, do you think this is a game, I got to take it right at him? Um, it doesn't really matter, you know, what year a player is. Um, you know, I just try to have the same uh, mindset every game, you know, stay aggressive, uh, stay in attack mode and drive the ball downhill. So, you know, we'll get back and look at tape and, uh, you know, try to figure out um, a few of their weaknesses on the defensive end and you try to take advantage of that. Jordan Wolf, Daily Kansas. And Frank, you kind of mentioned this, but for either of you, is the approach any different knowing you're going against a coaching legend and Tom Izzo? Devontae, please. You said, is the approach any different? Like, uh, no, nah, we approach it every game the same. You know, we got to prepare for the team that we're facing, uh, focus in on our scout report, and come out and be aggressive and play the same way we've been playing all year. Is that a question? Yes, all the way in the back. Uh, Dalton Scheller, Spartan Sports Network. When Nick Ward is on the floor and out of foul trouble, he's really made his impact in the last few games, had 19 points uh, just last night. A lot of teams have started to double down on him. Is that a, a type of strategy you guys will take into uh, facing Nick Ward down inside? Devontae again, please. Um, it'll probably depend on if he's, if he's dominating us down low or not. Um, I mean, it's, it's really up to coach and, and what he really wants to do. Uh, but hopefully we can contain him enough and keep him off the glass and, and uh, make him take tough shots. Back row. David Lawrence, Jayhawk, IMG Radio. For both of you, the media's made such a big deal about the fact that you're playing more minutes and, you know, are, are you well rested? Has that been overblown this year? And then second question for you both, uh, have you noticed in playing in the NCAA the uh, extended rest time with timeouts and halftime? Frank, first. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, we hear a lot of people talking about how many minutes uh, we play. Um, I think as athletes and competitors, uh, it really doesn't matter how many minutes we out there. Uh, once we off the court, we do a great job of taking care of our bodies and getting in the hot tub, cold tub, doing recovery boots and getting with our trainers and things like that to, you know, to, to make sure we're feeling a lot better for the next day. And um, I forgot the other question. <laughs> timeouts and rest time with extended timeouts in the tournament and longer halftime. Oh yeah, I definitely could tell, you know, um, well, it just feels a lot longer, you know, than the normal time out um, throughout the regular season. And um, I think it's good for both teams. Uh, just like he said, you know, you can notice it in the timeouts, getting rest and stuff like that. Halftime was super long yesterday. Uh, but 
um, as far as being tired and and playing a lot of minutes uh, at this time of the year, you know, you don't, you can't really get tired. Um, the best players got to be on the court, um, making plays and and doing whatever we can to help the team win. Anything else for the student athletes of Kansas? Yes, back down here in the aisle. We're under five minutes to go. Jackson knows a number of these kids on the Michigan State. Has he talked much about either his relationship with them or the way they play? Frank? Uh, he hasn't said much about them, but, you know, we talked about it just a little bit. You know, I think everyone in, in Michigan really wanted him to go there. And, um, you know, uh, we're going to go out there tomorrow and, and play for him, uh, for our families, for our school coaches, and, and ourselves. So we just want to really get it done for him and, you know, uh, make sure he has the best day possible. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. Right. Good job and good luck. Thanks.
Now the head coach of the Jayhawks, Bill Self, is with us. He's got a date with Michigan State tomorrow, 415 Central Time. We're going to ask him to make a quick statement, and then we'll go to questions. Bill? Well, obviously a quick turnaround for everybody that, that uh, has a chance to advance, and, and certainly uh, looking forward to the opportunity to, to uh, play a, a terrific Michigan State team and program and coach, and, and uh, certainly uh, um, you know one that when I, when I saw the, when I saw the initial bracket, and I'm seeing Michigan State in the in the eight nine game, I'm like, going, what kind of joke is this? Uh, 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 because you know when when they play like they did last night, they're playing to a very 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 high seed. Uh, they were terrific. Bill, you've got a, a, a veteran All American point guard. The guy they rely on is a, a, a true freshman a lot who's had some defensive struggles. When you see that sort of matchup, does that become something you really try to exploit? When you look at Cassius Winston, what do you see? I see a guy that can really see the floor. I think he's one of the best passers in college basketball. Uh, uh, you know, he's got more assists than Frank and is playing 13 less minutes a game than Frank. So that, to, to me, you know, uh, to me, I, I see uh, uh, those positives. And, and, and granted, you know, when you, when you, when you scout, uh, you look at certain things that may be an advantage for you, them over us or us over them. But the reality of the way that Tom's teams guard, uh, uh, you know, there, there's, there's this. It's the makeup is, is you know, you guard your man, but they're always in strong help and and always uh, uh, forcing you to play around the perimeter. So they do a real good job of keeping the ball out of the paint. Hey, Coach Kurt Voigt, Associated Press. What you talked about Michigan State playing over its seed, I guess a little bit. What what is it over the years you've seen under Coach Izzo that has allowed them to do that, and how does that maybe help you kickstart your guys to to make them a little more aware? I don't know. I don't know that. Uh, I don't know that there's anything that will kickstart kickstart our guys to make us more aware. I mean, it goes without saying that we're aware. I mean, uh, <clears throat> I had the chance to coach against Tom three years in the league, and we play in the Champions Classic, and we we played. Uh, 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 we don't play every year, but we probably average playing about uh, every other year uh, since I've been at a, since I've since I've been gone. And, and um, you know, the, the thing about it, he's a terrific coach, and and I don't know what what he does uh, beginning of March uh, that's different than what most mortals do is, is uh, you know, he gets his team always ready to play. And, and, and our guys respect that and they know that. And, and certainly uh, that's not one that we have to remind our guys of because uh, uh, they're very well aware of it. All right, we have a question here. We're gonna go to the back and there's three in this circle here we'll come to. Go please. Bill, going back into the matchups again, when, you, when you've got the, the Jackson against Bridges matchup, I guess, first of all, do you anticipate them matching up against each other? And secondly, when you have two guys that are friends going against each other, is there, I guess, do you have to caution for a little bit of uh, emotional temperament? Yeah, that's a great point. I, I, <clears throat> I know that I've had that conversation with Josh. I don't know if Tom's had it, had it obviously, with Miles, but... but uh, you know they are close, and and, and they are buddies, uh, based on what uh, I've been told, and, <clears throat> and and certainly I don't see any way around them not being matched up against each other a lot. Uh, uh, I'm not saying every possession, uh, the entire possession, but but I, th there's there's I I really believe what what's best for both teams is that for for them to guard somebody naturally they're supposed to guard, and that's each other. So uh, it, it it'll be a fun matchup. All the way in the back, Bill. Casey Harrison, State News. Coach, going back to the uh, Cassius Winston, um, Coach Larinaga, Miami, he kind of compared him to Steve Nash. Do you see that, and are there any other players on Michigan State that you can kind of draw parallels with, either in the ACC or in the NBA or any other um, level of basketball that isn't the Big Ten? Uh, you know, uh, I don't know. Uh, I probably couldn't do it in the ACC because I don't coach in that league, but, but uh, uh, from the Big 12, I, I don't know if, if I would say that anybody really reminds me of, you know, to me, uh, you know, the big fellow reminds me of Zach Randolph. You know, may, may, he doesn't probably shoot as, as often from the perimeter, but I think there's a lot of similarities, hands and feet. Uh, uh, you know, Miles is, you know, obviously a, a fabulous world-class athlete, so there's a lot of guys you could probably draw comparisons to in the NBA. But, but uh, I, I, th I think, uh, uh, 
I think uh, uh, on the perimeter and, and of course Cassius. I, I I saw him play quite a bit in in, in AAU ball, and, and the thing that does impress me is is uh, he knows how to make the hard play, but more importantly, he knows how to make the easy play, and and uh, he's very good at it. Left hand side, Bill. Yeah, Bill John Hoover, the franchise. Um, doesn't have anything to do with tomorrow's game particularly, uh, but uh, Brad Underwood, it was announced today, has taken the Illinois job. Wanted to get your thoughts on how that changes at you know your alma mater, uh, your alma mater, and your thoughts on the Illinois job just in general. Well, I just heard it. I just heard it ten minutes ago, so it, it shocks me. I think it would shock most people uh, because obviously. Uh, you know, Brad was on a roll, I thought, in Stillwater, and, and uh, a lot of great things had transpired in the short time he's been there. So, uh, uh, you know, without knowing any details, I don't know what else to say. I mean, if, if that's, you know, congratulate him, and, and, and uh, but certainly uh, not discourage uh, Oklahoma State from still moving forward. I mean, because cause it, it's certainly, the program's certainly in better shape than it was a year ago. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure that they'll, 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 uh, I don't even want to use the word recover. I'm sure they'll they'll respond very favorably to this, but but uh, it it is a shock. You know, you you see a lot of coaching changes uh, uh, across America, but very rarely do you see one after just one year. But Brad Brad's a Brad's a really good guy and done a great job. And and but from the outside looking in, it, it looked to me like OSU and Brad fit very very well. Well, Illinois is a great basketball job. There there's no there's you know I was there. Uh, uh, there's no other way to look at it. It's one of the better jobs in the Big Ten. Uh, if you look at recruiting base and, and uh, uh, institution, location, uh, exposure, uh, budget, there's a lot of things about it that, 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 is, that is very, very attractive. Hi, Coach. Janina Edwards, ESPN. Uh, this second round matchup is just, we don't see this very often. And I'm sure that you and Tom, when you saw this potential in the bracket, you were like, oh no. Yeah. Knowing him as well as you do, can you give us a coach's scouting report on Tom Izzo and how you guys may have similar styles and maybe where you're different? Well, I, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, having coached against him in the league, uh, you know, they were the standard without question when we were in the league. I think they were a n number one seed three years in a row or something like that or, uh, uh, you know, in, in that time that I was in the league with him. And so they were the standard. So, you know, you, you always try to steal from other people that do it well. And, and uh, you know, just, just in, in general, I mean, philosophically, they're going to take good shots. Philosophically, they're going to try to steal extra possessions on the glass. All these things are going to try to score before your defense set. And they're really good at that. But, but the bottom line is, is, is they go from defense to offense historically as well as anybody in the country. And they rebound the ball offensively as well as anybody in the country historically. And, and, and uh, so, you know, just from a scouting report standpoint, I'm not saying anything that's not obvious, but you've got to eliminate transition and you have to do a great job on the glass. Matt Galloway with the Topeka Capital Journal. Coach, I'm kind of digging a little deep with this one, but your second game at KU, you upset number three, uh, Michigan State, back in 2003, and you said you hoped at the time it would build credibility with your players. Um, looking back at that, what are your memories of that win and, and how important it, it might have been to setting a good tone at the time? Well, I think, I think that win will probably have a lot to do with how we play tomorrow, you know, 14 years ago. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I can remember that. You know, Michigan State had a, a, I don't remember all their guys, but Shannon Brown was was a guy that was a high flyer they had then, and it was a great game. It was a fast-paced game. Uh, but when I when I talk about credibility with players, you know, I, I followed a guy that was ultra successful, and that was kind of a signature win early in my career there. That maybe the players could look at our staff and say, you know what, you know what they do also works too. Uh, so, so you know, it, it was probably it probably was a signature win uh, uh, going way back, but I, I don't remember enough about it to to uh, to give you many details. So, Coach Eric Bailey with the Tulsa World. This is a question I'd like to ask Coach Izzo too. But can you talk about maybe the biggest coaching mentor of your life, and how humbling is it when you do see your coaching tree, assistant coaches get head coaching jobs? Well, I, I think you know. Uh, I think as a head coach, it's our responsibility to put our assistants in a position where they can do the same things that you've been able to do. 
and certainly that was the case with me, you know, working for the guys that I work for. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, my biggest coaching mentor probably was Coach Sutton, you know, and he lives right here in town. Uh, you know, he's a Hall of Fame coach, and, and I had a chance to work for him for three years, and, and, and I probably uh, I learned a ton, uh, but I also uh, 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 learned how to run a program probably uh, uh, from him as much as anybody else. And, you know, working for Coach Brown and Leonard uh, uh, obviously were unbelievable experiences. And, and, and with Coach Brown, I learned more ball uh, in nine months than, than I have any other period of time because I knew nothing. So there was more room for to learn. And, and uh, uh, but, but, you know, not too many guys can say they've been coached, they've been mentored by three guys that all been national coach of the year. Uh, uh, and certainly that's been the case with me. I'm going to take you even further back in the way back machine to 1986, um, the game wow. at Kemper Arena. Uh, you were an assistant. Tom was an assistant in that game. What are your memories of, of that, that <laughs> clock game? Uh, was there a clock issue in that game? Uh, you know what? I, uh, I was assistant, but I was so, down, I was so far down in, in uh, seniority that I was assistant that sat in the, in the end zone about 15 rows up. So I, I didn't make the bench. Uh, during the NCAA tournament in '86, uh, uh, but I, I, you know, obviously Scott Skiles and company, and, and uh, but I don't really remember much about the clock. I think in Kansas they thought it was uh, uh, it, 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 there was no malfunction and everything was handled perfectly in Kansas, and I'm sure in the state of Michigan they thought totally otherwise. But I know it was controversial, uh, uh, and it, it was a you know an unbelievable win, obviously for Kansas. But but I really don't remember much about it. We have five minutes to go. The question is right here. What's the toughest part preparing for Bridges and Ward tomorrow? Uh, you know, I, I think the toughest part is you can you can tell guys what to do, but you know, when you play against good guys that are hard to handle, it's the execution isn't always uh, uh, what you tell. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to simulate uh, athletic ability. You know, M M Miles is is a uh, you know I don't, I don't really know him personally, but he's a he's an unbelievable athlete. But he's got unbelievable feel. I mean, you know, just making the extra pass or or just knowing when to cut. Uh, uh, and you know, and they play through him a lot. I mean, they they play through him probably about as much as they played through. Well, I guess Denzel last year, but they 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 put the ball in his hands a lot to make decisions. And and uh, and and Ward is a load that that that. You know, you can tell guys, you know, don't foul. But when you, when when two big bodies are colliding all the time, obviously there's contact. So I, I don't I don't know how you tell guys to to uh, to uh, prepare other than just scout and report like we do with everybody else. Coach, uh, Chris Lazarino with Kansas alumni. You mentioned before the term started that you were hoping your guys would play free and easy, and that. There was a potential concern with with young players who were potential one and dones that they might play tight mm -hmm. in their only NCAA. Did yesterday um, ease any concerns that you might have had about Josh? Well, I, I I don't think I had more concerns about Josh than I did anybody else to play free and easy. He's, he's played free and easy under pressure all year long. So uh, I thought I thought he handled the situation well, but I also thought our entire team handled the situation well. Coach, I asked Josh. I asked Josh what um, Tom Izzo's best recruiting sales pitch was to him during that whole process. And now I'd like to ask what you think your best sales pitch was, because obviously you won. Well, it's just so much warmer in Kansas than Michigan, I guess. I, I don't know. Uh, you know, he, he would have been an unbelievable impact player wherever he went. And, and uh, I, I do know that, that it, it, was, it was not an easy decision for him. but, but uh, Hey, we've lost enough guys to Michigan State. We should win one every now and then. And Tom's obviously battling some some size issues due to injuries. I, I guess from from your vantage point, is how how aggressive do your guards need to be in getting in and creating that contact with their bigs? Well, it's you, you could say the same thing. I mean, uh, uh, you know, they're they're battling some size issues, but so are we. You know, in, in a lot of ways. So, uh, I, I think it's going to be imperative for, for uh, both teams to s play aggressively, but, but also to, you know, you know play, play smart on defense. And, you know, when, when you have, when you have uh, two physical teams playing against each other, there's going to be contact and there, there will be fouls, but you don't need to add to that by, by uh, making dumb fouls. And certainly that's what we'll talk to our guys about. 
Bill, you talk about playing free and easy. What is the difference in your mind between players who can and players who, who can't? What are some of the things that allow guys to handle that pressure and relax? I, you know, uh, I, think, I think there's a lot of players that can play free and easy uh, that may be under certain situations, may not at that moment. Uh, I think uh, uh, there's a lot of different things going on. You know, uh, uh, seniors, this is it. So, so, you know, you want to go out and you attack and you don't, you say you don't wish it to happen, you go make it happen. But the bottom line is, is there's no more safety net. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, so sometimes play, guys play uh, not to lose as opposed to playing to win. I think that's natural in any sport, uh, any time. Uh, but, the, but the biggest thing is if, if, if you're going to succeed this time of year uh, in the basketball tournament, you, you got to go, you, you got to go take it. And, and, and the only way you can do that is being ultra aggressive and, and, and playing with confidence. And, and, you know, I would like to say that, that our guys do that all the time, but I don't know that that's true. And, and I, I, I bet Tom would say the same thing, too. Uh, I certainly hope it's true tomorrow, though. Anything else for the head coach of Kansas? All right, Bill. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Best you. of luck. Appreciate it. Student-athletes from Michigan State up next at 355. Spartans of Michigan State are here. They have a date with Kansas tomorrow, 415 Central Time. Miles Bridges, Tum Tum Nair, and Alvin Ellis III represent the student body. And we'll open up for questions. 
Immediately, right there on the end. Thank you. Kurt Voigt, Associated Press. Miles, were, were you aware um, before you came to Michigan State, I guess, uh, the school's reputation for, for winning these games is lower seeds? And, and what have you seen now that you've been a part of it? What, what do you, what's your explanation for why it, why it happened so much under Coach Izzo? Um, I, I think we play better as an underdog. Um, it just gives us more fuel to our fire. We play with more intensity and more energy. Um, and we're not satisfied with anything, so that's why I think we play better. Go ahead. Uh, Miles, Josh uh, Jackson said you guys have known each other since uh, fifth or sixth grade. Uh, what do you remember about when you first met and was he, a, he said he wasn't a very good player yet. Huh. Is that true? Uh, I, I wasn't a very good player back then. He was. Um, I mean, we've been we've been friends all our life. We played played with each other, played against each other. Um, this is probably going to be one of I don't know one of the toughest games that we played against each other. But yeah, I know him all my life. Janine Edwards, ESPN. So, Miles, can you give us a scouting report on Josh and what he does well and what you guys think you can maybe take a little advantage of? Uh, uh, he has a high motor. Uh, he never stops playing. He plays with a lot of energy. He stays on the glass. Um, we, we just have to keep him on the glass. That's what gives him a lot of his hustle points. Um, he, he's just a dog on the floor. That, that's basically what he does. Question on the end. Thank you. Jackson Schneider, 90.7 KJHK. Guys, you kind of got off to a slow start last night, but it just kind of seemed like out of nowhere something changed. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about maybe what it was that exactly changed for you guys? Alvin, you first, please. Then we'll go to Tum Tum. Um, you know, it started with our turnovers. Um, you know, they, they sped us up. Uh, they got us going, and they got easy transition buckets. Um, you know, once we, we stopped turning the ball over, they didn't score uh, that easily. And uh, we went up and we went on a run. <laughs> exactly what Alvin just said. Hi, Eric Bailey with the Tulsa World. Uh, can you talk a little bit about Coach Izzo's connection, not only with the current team roster, but former players that have come through the Michigan State program? For any of the players. Tom? Oh, it's just a special thing he has with his players. Um, he pushed them so hard to be the best they can be. And, and when you tell him your dreams, you know, he wanted for you just as bad as you wanted for yourself, sometimes maybe even more than you wanted for yourself. You know, so, you know, um, back at school, a lot of guys come back and, you know, always helping us out and showing us the ropes and how to do things in this program. And I think the family environment that he has created and the players created um, is what makes Michigan State so special. Back here, Janine. At times, you guys had four freshmen on the floor at once. I'm just curious what some of those timeouts were like and what sort of things Coach Izzo was saying to all of you as a group and how he was trying to use that time to teach and to coach, but also to get you guys through that game. Alvin, then we'll go to Miles. Um, you know, he was just saying we got to just keep staying solid. Um, you know, when we were up on a big lead, uh, we just had to keep, you know, stepping on their necks. Uh, we couldn't let up. We had to finish out the game. Uh, we had a little trouble in the past, you know, without, you know, with finish, finishing the games. And, you know, we just had to keep stepping on their necks. Uh, yeah, like Alvin said, um, we had trouble finishing games. But that just shows how mature of a team we have now. Um, our freshmen aren't freshmen anymore. So that, we just really grew up because back then I don't think that we could have finished that game out, but yesterday we did. All the way in the back, gentlemen. Uh, Tum Tum, you've had to play against some really tough point guards recently, and Derek Walton Jr., Nate Mason, Melo Trimble. What is different uh, that Frank Mason brings to the table, and how are you prepared to guard him? Um, he's a lot like those guys. Um, I say he shoots it better than most of those guys. Um, he's shooting like 50% from three. Um, he's really, really aggressive in transition. So I just got to, you know, stay solid on him and make him take tough shots. Um, with a player like him, you can't really stop him. All you can do is contain him and make him take tough shots. And, you know, I'm going to have a lot of help from my teammates in guarding him.
on the end. Elvin, uh, Kansas likes to play fast. Are you going to try to slow them down, or, or do you guys like getting in a track meet as well? You know, that's our game. Um, we, you know, we like the, the fast pace of games, and, uh, you know, we, we don't get tired that easily. Uh, we got a lot of depth on the, on the floor and uh, on, our, on our bench, and uh, we'll be ready for that matchup. Anything else for the Spartans? Yes, in the back row. Thank you. David Lawrence, Jayhawk Radio. Guys, uh, even though a lot of national people look at this as a, as a you know, game, a very close game, the seed line suggests 1-9. Uh, does that kind of give you a mental advantage, kind of frees you up, uh, being able to play freer, and the fact that the pressure is usually on the one seed? Miles and Tom? Uh, I mean, it, it's still a lot of pressure on us because it's winner go home. Uh, we got, we, both of the teams, we have to have a sense of urgency because uh, I'm pretty sure they don't want to go home either. So it's, we're not free at all. It's a lot of pressure on us. Uh, in this tournament, it's all or nothing, man. You just got to go out there and play this game like it's your last game because it could be. Uh, so for us, we're not focusing on the seeds. We're just focusing on doing whatever we can to get a win. Speaking of former players, uh, Coach, we were talking about being embarrassed after the Minnesota game, being out toughed, and that not being acceptable. Have you heard or gotten any feedback from former players with regard to that? Alvin? No, I haven't. I haven't gotten any, you know, com uh, comments about that game. Anything else for the student athletes of Michigan State? All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank good you. job and good luck. Thank you. Tom Izzo is our last interviewee at 415 to 433. Thank you.
just heard it. I didn't know that. I, I left here with Robin Hood. Uh huh. Okay, our final interview of the day is the Michigan State head coach, Tom Izzo. He has a date with Kansas tomorrow at 4.15. We're going to have him open up with a statement. Then we'll go to questions. Tom. A date, that's what you call it. I've had some bad dates in my days, but <laughs> this could be the worst. Um, yeah, you know, I, we're really excited. I mean, uh, there's no question uh, Kansas might be the best team in the country if you look at the experience they have, uh, the guard play, which usually wins for you in a tournament, very well coached, um, lethal fast break. And I think the one advantage, you know, that we've had is, you know, this will be the fourth team that was one time or another ranked number one in the country, and Arizona was, I think, as high as three. And Wisconsin just beat one of the number ones, and we had a chance to beat them at the end of the year. So um, at least I think we've, we've played – uh, we can tell our team we played against a lot of these teams um, that are ranked high, and on any given Sunday, um, you know, it's about the 40 minutes of ball that's being played. And uh, there's no question we might have played 30 of the best minutes of basketball we played all year in that uh, stretch. There's no question we might have played um, some of the worst and dumbest basketball of the year in the first 10 minutes of that game. Uh, with the turnovers and the foul two seconds into the game, which set a Michigan State record, maybe North American, to be honest with you. And so, uh, you know, we can go both ways with our youth. You're talking about a very experienced team against a very young team. But one thing about youth, you win a game and there is an excitement, there's an enthusiasm, there's um, a new feeling. And, uh, and that's helped me even, you know, when you win a – decent amount of games in this tournament like we have over the years. It's just, I won't say it's ho-hum, but it gets to be. There was nothing ho-hum about yesterday for me or for them, and hopefully that'll propel us into uh, playing well tomorrow against a good team, and there should be a few Kansas fans here, I would think, and it'll be, uh, it'll be a great situation for us. Two questions up right away. Go ahead, please. Uh, Cody Tucker, Lansing State Journal. Uh, Coach, uh, you touched on it a little bit last night uh, about Aaron Harris and his importance through this run. Can you can you expand on that a little bit and talk about what Aaron's really meant to this team, especially all the youngsters you have? Well, Aaron was the best defensive player we had, and uh, so he, uh, you know, I would like at least to be able to put him on Mason, which I don't think will happen now. But uh, I told him, uh, you know, right after the game, you know, you got to have some film sessions with those guards yourself and explain some things to him. Number one, to try to keep him involved. Number two, to try to use his knowledge. Uh, sometimes, uh, as I always say, a player coach team is better than a coach coach team. And he can talk about things that he had to deal with and guarding Mellow Trumbull and guarding this guy and guarding that guy. And um, I think, uh, you know, he had to guard him some last year when we played him. So uh, that's what we're trying to use Aaron as, keep him involved. Uh, he's been unbelievable. Um, you know, he could have just hung his head, and he's been with us every meeting, everything that's happened. Uh, really appreciate what he's given this team. Kurt Boyd, Associated Press. Coach, this uh, what's your explanation um, for the success you guys have had as an underdog in the lower seed in the NCAA tournament? And over the years, when did it become something um, that maybe you embraced or even talked about with the kids? Yeah, personally, I don't like it. <laughs> you know, somebody told me that yesterday and said, you know, well, yeah, I don't know, tied somebody's record or broke somebody's record. I said, for what? And they said, well, NCA wins. And I said, are you kidding me? And then they explained to me that uh, as a as a worse seed, we uh, we upset. That means we're a bad seed a lot of times. So um, I don't feel as good about that as maybe I should. But I do think that, uh, you know, when I had the Flintstones and that group of guys back in 97, 98, that started this whole thing, um, it was just a bunch of blue collar tough guys that um, you know nobody gave a chance to in a lot of ways. And we just kind of earned our way. And that was the culture that we developed. And thank God those guys are still part of that culture because they all come back. They all text and call these guys. and let them inform they inform bridges on what it's supposed to be like if you're a flintstone you better be doing this this and this and and i think that's helped i i, I really think it's the culture we developed that we're 
and the schedule we play, I don't think we're afraid of anybody um, because we've already played some of those teams. Doesn't mean we'll go beat anybody, but it it means that you can knock that off the list. You know, it's not like like some teams will say, "Well, we've never played that kind of schedule. We've never played those kind of teams. We've played them all." So. Uh, Maybe it's the lack of fear of that that has given us some success over the years. Way in the back, Tom. Coach, I asked uh, Coach Self the same question, but can you talk a little bit about the biggest coaching mentor that you've had in your career? And then just how humbling is it when you see your own assistant coaches kind of evolve into your own co coaching tree? Oh, it's awesome. It's, it's the best thing I get to have happen to me. You know, I lo love when my when, when anybody in your program gets to kind of live his dream because that's what I tell my guys every day you know coming from Iron Mountain Michigan and being the head coach at Michigan State and you know winning a national championship and getting some of the things that have happened to me that that's more than a dream that means I live my dream you know very how many people get to live it and I think when you watch a coach move on or a player move on they're getting to live their dream and uh, my biggest mentor was Judd Heathcote by far you know uh, my father but as a coach it was Judd now I'm a little different because I grew up, you know, in that area where there's 11 months of winter, one month of poor sledding up in the UP. And uh, so I grew up like 95 miles from Vince Lombardi and the Green Bay Packers, you know. And I've read every book that Vince ever put out, so I kind of had that football. I grew up idolizing a lot more of those football guys than I did even basketball guys. And uh, so I've, uh, I've had a lot of guys that, uh, that have influenced my life, but Judd Heathcote, um, not only did he give me the chance, but he, he kind of, it was the perfect guy for me, you know. Uh, I mean, where I'm from, you just kind of work when you're young, and that's what you do, and that's kind of the same way Judd was. I said he never asked me to do anything he wouldn't do himself. And, uh, and you know, he gave me one piece of advice for all of you, for the media, that I've kind of used, and I think it's been great for me. And when I used to ask him why, He'd treat you guys so nice when I, there was times they wanted to fire him. There was times, you know, and they'd be writing articles. And he gave me that piece of advice that, remember, everybody's got a job to do and everybody's got a boss to answer to. Everybody's got a family to feed. I agree with that most of the time. Once in a while, I don't. But for the most part, I, I think that's been good advice. Tom, you mentioned Cassius was improved uh, yesterday. This is a whole different animal a little bit. And Frank Mason. What do you tell him before this? And is this a real test of his improvement and the, the gap <clears throat> help defense and all the stuff that's around him, him trusting that and everything working? Well, as I called some coaches last night that played against uh, Frank Mason, um, the, the common denominator of advice would, was, well, remember now, you're not going to stop him. Don't try to game plan to stop him because it's not going to happen. You know, you hope to somewhat contain him and make sure he doesn't let everybody else get better because of what he can do in his penetration and shooting. And just been a great story on that kid, you know, where he came from and where he started out, where he almost went to school and where he is now. Um, you know, if I wasn't playing against him, I'd be his biggest fan. When I'm done playing against him, I'll still be his biggest fan. But yeah, we're not going to guard him with one guy. Uh, I'm thinking of going untraditional, playing a box in one putting the box on Frank and the one on the other four guys, you know, it's, uh, he's got that big of an impact on a, on a game and they've got other good players. I mean, Josh Jackson kid we recruited hard is, has just gotten better and better and better. I know how good he is, but, uh, Mason is the, you know, straw that stirs the drink. He's the guy that seems like every big shot he's involved in, um, what he's shooting, uh, what he's doing is, is phenomenal. I mean, if he isn't, you know, we prejudice that we've got uh, Schwanigan in our league, who's a player of the year candidate. But uh, I could see either one of those two guys getting it, and I, I think it would be a good choice. Jordan Wolf, Daily Kansan. Coach, just wondering what your initial reaction was when you saw the potential matchup with Bill Self in Kansas on Selection Sunday. You know, it wasn't that big when I first saw it. It wasn't that big because I, I was just trying to survive Miami and I don't think I realized who we were playing until after we won. And I'm saying that a little bit uh, fooling around. But, you know, Bill and I have been through a lot. You know, he was at Illinois. Um, we've played each other in the NCAA tournament. We've played in the Tournament of Champions more than a couple times. Uh, uh, I think there's great respect. Uh, you know, we've been friends for a long time. When he was here at Tulsa, 
we played them over in Maui in a hell of a game, and his team was good. I think that was the year they went to the Sweet 16. Might have been the year we won it. Um, so it's been a long history. Uh, I have great respect for what he's done. Um, you know, it's not Ellen Fieldhouse, but it's probably Ellen Fieldhouse. What is it? East, west, north. I flunked geography south I, well, somewhere, and uh, not that far from there. But uh, uh, you know, I, I I do think they're one of the best teams in the country, and they've proven it. I saw them at the first game of the year when we played against Arizona out in uh, Hawaii, and uh, they haven't lost many games since then. We are halfway through. Janine has the next question. Hi, Coach Janine Edwards, ESPN. Along the lines of playing Kansas, how would you describe the similarities and the differences in style between you and Coach Self? Well, Janine, he has a, you know, this is not a traditional Bill Self team either, in my humble opinion. He's always had the uh, two bigs inside and, you know, like playing a lot of high to low and, um, you know, that two-man game that he's so well-known for. And this has been just a racehorse team that has four perimeter guys that can run and do things not as deep as some of his teams. Uh, Lucas is, uh, is a load in there. It's not that he's scoring a million points, but every he's got his body on somebody every single time, and he's big, and he's gained a lot of weight since the last time, a lot of strengths. He's done a nice job with himself, and... Um, as I said, you know, I, I uh, had a great appreciation for those two guards, and, and I think Josh Jackson and, um, was one of the more coveted recruits, if not, you know, one of two most coveted recruits in the country. So uh, I think it's a different Bill Self team than he's had. I think they, the fast break is as good as I've ever seen, um, but it's not quite the pounded inside, which they'll probably do tomorrow, uh, especially if our center finds a way to get a foul in the first two seconds again. Uh, I, I'm thinking about not starting him uh, for a little bit of breaking news just to keep him out of that. But uh, I think Bill has done a great job. It's amazing, amazing that they've won, what, 12, 13 uh, Big 12 championships in a row. Um, that is what all coaches aspire to do is, is not win big games but have consistency. And I don't know of anybody who's been more consistent than Bill. Question in the back. Thank you. David Lawrence, Jayhawk Radio Coach, last night, you know, for those of us that has not seen your team, you look like a, a number one seed. I know you're young, but what are some of the things that have arisen in, in the past season that has caused you problems with your youth? <laughs> Which part of us look like that number one the first 10 minutes? Or, you know, we have made no, uh, listen, I got a talented bunch of freshmen. You know, what, I, what we're lacking at some of these, I mean, Kentucky has a bunch of freshmen. They have some seniors that play, you know. Duke has got a bunch of guys that play, and even though they're playing their freshmen. Um, this is new territory for me, too, but, but I love my freshmen. I love... My guys, they've been unbelievable this year. But with the things we put them through with the travel and the schedule and the losing and the pressure of not making the tournament and all the things, but they have gotten better the last 10 games. We are getting better, um, but getting better, um, we got some deficiencies. Although, you know, Kansas is not as deep as they've normally been there. I mean, uh, that's what makes the job he's done so incredible because uh, they can't afford to get anybody in foul trouble either, you know. and. So I, I don't know, you know, we're a, we're a good team that uh, I'm anxious to see how we respond to having some success. And I say that, you know, we beat Wisconsin late in the year. We were playing better then. They just beat Villanova. And, uh, but last night, the biggest thing we did, I mean, we didn't get punched in the nose. It was, we got knocked out in those first eight minutes. I mean, when you're down 17 to five, with, with all those those uh, young guys, I mean, it, you could lose it. And when they came back, that was a giant step. And even though we don't have the experience, now we have some enthusiasm that young guys have, that older guys, you know, just another day. Uh, do your job, get it done. You know, these guys, I think, are excited, you know. How far that'll carry us, I'm as anxious to see as maybe a lot of our fans are. 
We're about three minutes to go. Janine has the next question. Do you have any stories from your days recruiting Josh Jackson? Um, what do you remember? Um, you know, how, how, how good was your sales pitch? Obviously, Bill's might have been a little bit better, but <laughs> what were some of your better lines and experiences with him? I just got on my hands and knees and begged him. You know, that's what I did. And that wasn't as good as Bill's. But, uh, hey, you know what? Um, I love Josh Jackson. He, he's, a, he's a great kid. Uh, recruited him since, like, ninth or 10th grade. Uh, you know, even though he went to prep school out in California, um, he, you know, I, I think he has what all of us appreciate. You know, you can talk about his ability to put the ball on the floor and run the lane and this and that. I think he plays as hard as any player I've seen in a lot, a lot of years. And when star players, I mean, I think I have a special guy, you know, in Miles Bridges. When star players play that hard instead of the just go through the motions that sometimes you see uh, makes it special. Um, you know, was it sad and disappointing? It was, because I think it was, I think it was a, a, a close fight to the finish. But um, talked to Josh after it. Uh, unlike some guys, he had the courage and the and the uh, respect to call and tell me. You know, a lot of kids don't do that. Uh, I'll always be a Josh Jackson fan, um, except for tomorrow night for 40 minutes. You know, other than that, uh, um, you know, and he's pretty good friends with a lot of our guys that he played with. So it's it's all good, you know. I mean, uh, what you hope for in competition is to hate your enemy but respect them. And uh, that's kind of the way, you know, it's got to be. And, like, the respect I have for Bill, his program, but Josh in particular, since I was close to him, is off the charts. But I think he has some of that similar respect for some of my players too. Kansas and Michigan State tomorrow, 4.15. Don't be late. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> I got one guy I want a little late, so I didn't get a foul. But, uh... <laughs> That's right.